Hello, everybody, and welcome tonight to the Media Mentoring Project's uh, program on Speaking Your Truth, Opinion Writing. So glad everyone can be with us this evening. For those who don't know me, I am Olga Peters. I am a freelance journalist, uh, former reporter for the Commons, as well as the host and producer of the podcast and show on BCTV, the Montpelier Happy Hour. Tonight's discussion is sponsored by Brattleboro Savings and Loan and is presented by Vermont Independent Media, who is the publisher of The Commons, an award-winning free weekly newspaper based in Brattleboro, Vermont, and also the sponsor of the Media Mentoring Project. Brattleboro Community Television is our technical sponsor tonight. We wanna to thank them for helping us out. They will be muting folks' microphone, um, taking care of cameras, as well as um, helping with any technical issues that might come up this evening, because it's Zoom and it's the virtual world. We know how those things happen. <laughs> um, we have the following speakers tonight. I'm so glad they can be joining us this evening. I'm going to start with um, introducing Melanie Winters. Melanie, if you wouldn't mind, thank you. Melanie Winters is the news editor uh, for the, sorry, news editor Melanie Winters has been a journalist for over 30 years. She has been with The Reformer for more than 10 years, first as night editor and currently as managing news editor. And the 145 year old Reformer uh, is along with the Bennington Banner and the Manchester Journal owned by Vermont News and Media Group, which purchased the papers in 2021. Next up, I want to introduce um, my former editor and former, uh, well, not classmate, but schoolmate, Jeff Potter. <laughs> hey, Jeff. <laughs> hey, Olga. We've known each other a long time. Um, Jeff has almost 40 years of experience in all aspects of publishing starting with a number of newspapers in Western Massachusetts in the 1980s. He has edited, published, produced, designed, and consulted on a number of publications, everything from Labors of Love, produced in friends' basements, to premier um, book designs. In 20, 2008, oh my gosh, like, wow, that's a long time, Jeff. Um, Jeff joined Vermont <laughs> Independent Media as the first permanent editor, editor of this grassroots newspaper, uh, The Commons, um, took the publication from a monthly to a beloved and highly respected award-winning weekly. He has a degree in math and computer science with a concentration in ancient Greek, which he says was a good idea at the time. And he earned that at Middlebury College. Um, he lives in Shelburne Falls, Massachusetts with his wife, Susie, and their two cats, one of whom is named after a typeface. Because I don't think there's a typeface in the world Jeff has met that he could not recognize and name. Elaine Cliff. Hello, Elaine. Thank you for joining us tonight. Um, Elaine is an award-winning writer and journalist. Her work has appeared in the Washington Post, the Boston Globe, the Christian Science Monitor, the Chronicle of Higher Education, Salon, and numerous magazine periodicals and anthologies. She is a regular columnist for several New England newspapers and a reviewer of the New York Journal of Books. The author of two memoirs, two books of poetry, three short story collections, a travel memoir, and three edited anthologies. Her poem, Listen and My Heart is Breaking, sorry, Elaine, I Listen and My Heart is Breaking, was set to music and performed by the world-renowned a cappella group, Sweet Honey and the Rock. And she offers writing workshops at various venues, ranging from conferences and arts programs to uh, destination locations as well. Hey, hello, McLean Gander, glad you can join us tonight. Mac Gander uh, is an investigative, <clears throat> excuse me, investigative journalist with um, the Commons, and he is also um, a professor at Landmark College. He grew up in Manhattan um, and spent summers in Guilford, which is how he, I guess, came to love this place. Um, he has studied poetry at Harvard and Boston University, where he was 
the Hoyt Fellow in Creative Writing in 1981. He practiced journalism at Newsweek International in Manhattan and for The Nation in Manila during the 1980s before moving to Vermont and going into education. In addition to working at Landmark, he joined the VIM board in 2019 and currently serves as acting secretary in addition to his role as reporter and writer. He lives in Brattleboro, Vermont with his wife, Chantilly Gander. So that is our panel tonight. So glad you can all be here. Um, we're going to start uh, speaking with some of the editors and then I, we will hear from Elaine and Mac. So uh, I would love to dive in um, and give a quick check in the chat. If anyone has any questions throughout uh, the evening, feel free to drop them in the chat and during question and answer time, we will try to pull from there um, and answer some questions. So ready, Jeff and Melanie. So um, I'd love to start with you, Melanie. Describe for us the process of um, putting together the op-ed section of the reformer. What are some of the things um, you consider when you're, when you're uh, going through all your letters to the editor or your um, op-eds? Okay, well, there's four main elements to our opinion page, provided if we have just one opinion page, I would love it if we had more and then we could have <laughs> more. But the four main elements are we have um, an editorial. If we have time, we'll write one ourselves. Sometimes we'll take one from the Washington Post, the New York Times um, and Wall Street Journal, you know, some of the biggies. Uh, we also have uh, letters to the editor and then a, an op ed or a commentary, uh, usually from somebody in the area. Um, about a, um, a, a prominent issue that people are discussing, whether it's statewide or local. Um, and um, it's a lot of it, the difference between letters and, and commentaries or, or op-eds, uh, some of it has to do with length. Letters are generally shorter and more to the point. Uh, commentaries and op-eds, they're usually a little bit longer, more in depth, and they usually come from people who have some expertise on the topic or from like, you know, a, a local or a state official who, who is working in that area or something like that, or an elected official who, you know, has a little bit of authority to speak and we, we allow them a little bit extra space to do that. Mm -hmm. And you may have said this and I'm sorry if I didn't hear it. Do you have um, a prescribed word count? So if someone's sending in a letter to the yeah, editor. Yeah, actually, good, good follow-up question. I didn't mention that. Um, for letters to the editor, we ask people to try and keep it to under 700 words, um, usually less. Uh, for opinions, uh, commentaries, and op-eds, um, about 1,000, give or take. Less. We don't like people to go over 1,000 words. Okay. Uh, we've, we've had that happen before, and I've, I've kicked it back to them, and oh, I can't cut anymore. I can't. And I'm like, I'm sorry. We, you know, <laughs> we can't guarantee. We could try to get this in but it may take several days and they don't want to wait several days because mm -hmm. they want to get it in soon. So, you know, it's amazing how when they, they look back at it, they find some areas to trim back. And, and some of yeah. them, sometimes people actually thank me and say, you know, that was a good exercise for me. Nice. And it's nice to hear that, um, that there's kind of a back and forth between. Yes. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you, Melanie. So Jeff, um, now the reformer is um, a daily. Mm -hmm. And the Commons is a weekly. You have a slightly different structure to the uh, opinion page. It's called the Voices section. Okay. Um, so same question. What are some of the things you consider when you're going through um, submissions to Voices? Well, there, there, uh, <clears throat> there are two different uh, kind of two different uh, pools from which I select things. Number one is the uh, material that people send in to and people are always welcome to send it, uh, send it to uh, to voices at commonsnews.org. That's our dedicated email address to make sure that goes right into the queue. Uh, and every every Saturday morning, I take a I sit down and take a look at that and see what we got. Uh, the other the other pool from which I choose is uh, keeping my eyes and ears open to um, to the wide world out there and to people who make impassioned posts on Facebook to, uh, to blog posts. Sadly, the, that, that seems to have 
uh, uh, diluted a little bit in the past uh, the past decade, but especially when blogs were a thing, I would sit down and uh, perform Google searches on Dummerston blog, uh, uh, mm. Marlboro blog, mm. particularly in the earlier days of the paper when we were less established and uh, and I was uh, you know I really had and also when I was still learning well, you never stop learning the community, but I knew very few people in town. So I've got to get, uh, you know, so that was a really good place to begin because you, you're, you're going from a position of where people, where you're starting from the position where people are trying to get their voices out there. Mm-hmm. And maybe you have you know, the, the, the transition from a really well-written Facebook post to an op-ed is surprisingly, um, easy and, uh, and, and uh, effective. And it gives people a, a, a very different audience and a little bit of an imprimatur of, uh, of uh, legitimacy. Mm-hmm. If, which is not to say that, I mean, the, uh, the, I'm hearing myself say that and that's, uh, oh my God, no. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it, it's just a very different, uh, it's, it's just a very different sort of, um, a venue for your writing and it's a it's it's probably a little bit more traditional and uh and uh it gets it gets you into the uh into the hands of more readers mm-hmm. so uh, well it's the town square i mean the, exactly. the op-ed pages are yeah. the town square a town square or a I town say, square i would yeah. argue that social media is another town square mm-hmm. where, whether one is better or, the, or not maybe a different uh forum to to have but uh so anyway i I do take a, I do try to get a, a lot of, I, I spend a lot of time poking through uh, because I don't want our pages to be exclusively the domain of people who have, uh, who are in positions of authority and power. I mm-hmm. really want to empower people who ha- who are, who might not have a traditional background in writing um, and really give, uh, you know, and who have something to say worth saying. So you know, you've got this, you've got the, so you've got this sprawling uh, array of, of voices from people who, who maybe have some power and authority who shouldn't, <laughs> but, uh, but have, should, you know, but are in the public arena and readers really should know what they're, they're reading, you know, should, should you know, have a legit, there's a legitimate need for people to, uh, you know, to know what they're thinking and how they're thinking. Mm-hmm. And then also, uh, you know, people that, uh, you know that that uh, I, I I just uh, I just find these gems all the time. I get so excited to find new writers who, especially writers who really just aren't themselves seeking to get into print and really right. shepherd them into that world. Does Thank that you, answer Jeff. your question? It it does it does. Um, are there any other um, <clears throat> for folks who might be considering submitting something to Voices? Uh, anything they should consider around like word length or um, anything like that? Well, Melanie's going to wince when I say this, um, but in all the years I've been doing this, I have never counted words. And at this point, I'm going to be really honest and say I never will. Now, what I'm really looking for is is whether what you're writing is as long as it has to be and as short as it can be. That's mm-hmm. the sweet spot. And if it's lo- it's and if it's longer than it needs to be, then we will have that conversation that, similar to the one that Melanie was describing. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would love working with writers. I love doing back and forths. I love it when they push back on edits. Um, maybe not at the moment, but um, but but I love that process. That that it can be a it can be a collaborative process because it is, after all, somebody else's name on the piece. Uh, the last thing I ever want to do is impose my voice or my opinions on something or misrepresent the, 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 the gist of what anybody's saying. I try to edit, I try to edit voices minimally. Mm-hmm. Uh, some people may be surprised at that, but, but that's <laughs> at least what I'm trying to do. Thank you, Jeff. Um, I, I know I said I'd, I was going to wait for chat questions until the end, but one just came up that I think is pertinent to what we're talking about now. Um, uh, John Snyder has asked, uh, said, I understood Melanie to say she had four cr- criteria on letters. Uh, 
he only heard one. Can you speak to the other three quickly? Oh, no, I'm sorry. I I said we have four elements on our opinion page. That's the editorial, the cartoon, the letters and the uh, commentary or op ed. Um, In terms of what we look for in letters, um, I mean, we'll, we'll run everything as long as it's clean and not nasty. Mm-hmm. And is it dripping with with disinformation or or accusations, false yeah. accusations? Yeah. Well, well, thank you for saying that, because that kind of leads me to my next question. Um, you know, um, what's the difference between opinion writing and reporting, especially around the, the realm of like fact checking and slander and libel? Um, mm-hmm. Again, Melanie, Melanie, I'd love if you would start. Okay. Um, Well, a reporter in a story, a reported story, obviously you're looking to get both sides of the story, comments from both sides. Um, You try to balance how they're presented and, and, you know, try to uh, reduce or eliminate the number of adjectives you use. (laughs) Um, (laughs) um, With opinion writing, uh, you know, you're trying to persuade to somebody to a certain point of view. You, You might throw in the other side just for to refute it, basically. <laughs> um, but you're definitely trying to persuade somebody to a certain point of view. Okay, thank you. Yep, I'm sure you have. Yeah, uh, well, that. I would say that, that the, you know, in a perfect world, everything that goes into our voices section, I do try to fact check as, as much as reasonably possible. Uh, if I see a quote, I will put it into Google and see if it returns that quote. Um, and sometimes, uh, sometimes I'll, we'll we'll get some surprises, and that's and that informs you know kind of where we go from there. Uh, I've caught a couple of plagiarists. I've caught caught a couple of self plagiarists who you know never disclosed that they were recycling columns from that they wrote for other publications, uh, which you know I you know I mean but. <laughs> I mean, it was That's a whole other story. It was fun to watch. It was it was fun to watch him squirm. Uh, <laughs> but but really, the uh, you know, I I try to I try to give as much rope as possible to uh, to contributors, um, it, up to and including uh, contributors that may have some unpopular opinions. Uh, you know, we don't get you know, a, a lot of a lot of our writers are speaking to you i mean this is a very liberal co- county and we don't have a lot of representation of of uh, right of center voices mm-hmm. um you know but i you know but i whatever we do i really try to check and make sure that everything is based in reality like confirmable reality mm-hmm. Uh, once I followed a, a letter uh, around a kind of a daisy chain of citations back to the original you know, and that ended up no literally nowhere, mm-hmm. uh, which which, uh, you know, where I think it, I think it had something to do with a controversy about several years ago about uh, refugees in Rutland. Um, yeah, I think I remember that. And, uh, and it was just some outrageous thing. Uh, you know, you just don't I check those things. I really do. Well, here's a question for both of you, because um, I, I sometimes hear from, from folks um, outside the newspaper who will say, well, it's an opinion piece. You don't have to fact, fact check it. Um, okay. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, that's, you know, I mean, it's, I mean, it's, if you want, uh, and, and going back to your original question about kind of the line between opinion and, and reportage, I mean, the, the, it really is a spectrum, and uh, and the voices section really is, does accommodate things that are really uh, very you know very much uh, reported journalism that is coming fro- with somebody with a an obvious uh, or disclosed conflict of interest or attitude. It doesn't mean it's not journalism, uh, but it does mean that it's not your traditional uh, that that if you're not even trying for objectivity, then it doesn't belong on the news pages. Mm -hmm. Uh, So that's, uh, that's, there's, there is, there, there is a continuum there. Um, Have either of you um, ever received something that uh, crossed over the line into slander or libel? Hmm. Oh, I'm sure I know. I'm sure I have. I can't think of off the top of my head, but I'm sure. 
Mm-hmm. Um, but it is perhaps somebody that somebody happen. mentioning, I, I, you know, I, I can't remember details, but perhaps somebody mentioning some accusation or some incident oh. that that happened years ago. And they're kind of twisting it a little bit. And so I, I th- those those go in the circular file. Yeah. Gotcha. Uh, mm-hmm. And what 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 really gets thorny is if you have some some, um, shall we say, interesting uh, points of view from you know that from original you know from public meetings mm-hmm. where this stuff bubbles up to the surface uh and uh you know i'm you know elaine will remember the uh the infamous rockingham free public library debacle from a few years ago uh where um you legitimately had uh you had library trustees who were making these these allegations against their librarian mm-hmm. and they would they would, we would report things uh, or people would, people would write things that were based, you know, that were quoting meetings mm-hmm. or whatever. Um, I know at one point or another, there were things that I'm saying, can we, you know, should we print this? Can we print this? Right. I mean, it's, it, 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 when the meeting itself is hurtful, um, you know, you get, uh, you get, you get some, um, let's just say irreconcilable differences when it comes to trying to figure out the best course of action for, Mm -hmm. for making sure that people aren't hurt in our pages. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they will be, I don't, I never want that to happen, but, but sometimes in the, I'll always try to keep a space where people can be honest and, and forthright um, and do so fairly, um, but without hitting below the belt. Right. Yeah, I, th- I think there's a level of decency that we still try to maintain that has kind of crossed the line over on social media. Yeah, mm-hmm. sadly. Yeah, I, I hear you. Um, so uh, we have a, a few more minutes here. Melanie, any suggestions to, to folks who um, are considering either a, an opinion piece or a letter to the editor? Um, just any tips, tricks, thoughts that you'd like to share? Um, I would I would start with, you know, go by the old the old standard from composition class. Write an outline. Mm-hmm. Write an outline to organize your thoughts. You know, these are the central thoughts. Now, how am I going to approve that? What am I going to say to back this up? And what's what's my initial um, my initial phrase to hook everybody in? You mm-hmm. know, those those are the major elements of of writing it. The, the initial hook, the main points and then the summation. Okay, thank you, Jeff. I would, I would, I would wholeheartedly echo all of that, and I would also add right from the heart too. I mean, I think that that there's, you know, that you're not trying to spin anybody in a local newspaper letters column, uh, or you know, or you know, whether it's a letter or op-ed, whatever you want to call it. Uh, you, you're, tr- you're, um, you're, you're, you're just. This is a community forum, and you're part of the community, and uh, you you know, there's, uh, just be, be yourself, be honest. Uh, and what I try to do is, is try to, to gently help people be their best selves, uh, and in print and represent themselves, represent themselves in a way that can't be misconstrued, misunderstood, or where you don't sabotage yourself. Sometimes Mm -hmm. I won't print a letter because it's not going to be helpful to anybody, least of all the person who's trying to submit it. Mm -hmm. Uh, I've got my, 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 my most wince-worthy letter story was when you, when we got the, the wife of somebody who was convicted of a sex crime. I remember that in with a letter from their minor child that denigrated the victim of mm-hmm. her father. <laughs> that was a messy one. Yes. That, but that was also a very easy decision. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, if no one else remembers that letter, it's because it was never printed. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so um, I'm, I'm sure we, you know, we could, we could uh, have a beer and go over all sorts of other stories about <laughs> all the things that we don't print. But we, you know, I, you know, I, I like my, my, and and I would bet Melanie that you would have the same kind of this, the same vibe. There is how do we get to yes? I'm, I'm not in this to not print something. I really want to find what's really hiding behind there. And if something isn't printable, we, we do want to work with people and, and give them you actually advice. met with that family, didn't you? With the, with the wife and the, Oh yeah. You ended up was, meeting with them too. That, didn't was, you? that was, that was difficult. Yeah. Um, any last thoughts before um, I, I uh, bring on Mac and, and Elaine. 
can't think of anything. <laughs> uh, I would I would say that uh, uh, you're you're uh, we're about to introduce two people who are very important to the commons, and I appreciate their their contributions both to the uh, the newspaper and to the general Southern Vermont writing landscape. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, so for everyone in the audience, um, we're going to hear now from two writers who have published many wonderful pieces in the Commons, Elaine Cliff and uh, Mac Gander. Um, so glad you can both be with us today. First question for both of you, and, and just in case someone came on late, Elaine, would you just wave um, and Mac? Um, thank you. So <clears throat> I would love to hear from both of you because I, as I understand it, you have both done journalism as well as opinion writing. And um, curious for you, what's the, the difference between both of them and how do you approach um, a piece? You know, how do you, do you approach them differently? How about we start with Elaine, please? Um, thank you. And uh, thank you, Jeff, for the kind words. Um, I'm going to give you a shout out in a few minutes, but um, I appreciate that. Um, and I, I really love writing for this paper. It's one for the, for the commas. It's really a wonderful, wonderful model and, um, and home to be in. Um, so what I, my, I'm in a very different space when I'm doing journalism from when I'm doing columns. Right. And, and I'm, uh, so I'm very mindful that um you know, and, and I could be writing journalism because I pitched a story somewhere or because an editor has assigned a story to me. So I'm very conscious of what does the editor want, you know, um, and some editors are very clear about how they want you to approach the story. And some just say, write about this, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, if they know you, it's that it's comfortable and you kind of get where we're coming from and each of us is coming from. And But um, but I'm very conscious of journalistic ethics and, and of um, the importance of the, the fair and balanced idea and um, and being very sure that I've done my homework in terms of researching the topic. And um, and I do, you know, look for people who, who I can quote in order to make make clear what we're talking about in a, in a journalistic piece. Um, when I'm doing um, a, an op-ed, it's funny, people often ask me when I'm talking about writing, they ask me if I journal, mm -hmm. if I journal regularly. And I don't do, I don't journal in the sense that they're asking me. I don't keep a journal, but I'm journaling all the time because the op-eds are how I process everything that I'm concerned about or that I'm enraged about or that I'm happy about, you know. Hmm. So, so my whole mindset is different and I'm, and I'm, and, and they both are pleasurable. It's really great to do a story. I do some art writing, for example, and it's great to do a story about people's work or people's um, position on something or a, a key critical issue. But it's also wonderful to have a place where we can have, a, I can have a voice, uh, you know, that speaks to my, my take on things. And so, um, so I, and I think what they both share is that I do research. I do a lot of research for both because in an op-ed, I want to be credible and have, have back up some of the argument I'm making. Um, and I also um, want to be very careful about attribution. And this is where I'm going to do the shout out to Jeff because he has covered my back a few times when I have slipped up on that. And um, I see and, Mac know, nodding too, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so and it's wonderful the way he does it and that he does it and he does it so well. And I, I guess what I'm really saying is that no matter how much you've written or how experienced you are, you know, none of us is perfect. We all, we, every time we sit down to write a piece, we're sitting down as a beginner on that particular topic. Yeah. So, um, but I love the fact that, you know, I can, I can share my point of view and have a bit of a rant with, without being rude or off, you know, off putting. Uh, although I get do get a lot of hate mail, but um, <laughs> but so I, I really enjoy both sort of writing venues and um, and I'm just so happy to be able to and the other thing is I get a lot of lovely feedback from people who thank me for what I'm writing and who say that I've given voice to what they wanted to say. So I I can't do that in journalism, but I can do it in uh, so they're both very satisfying kind of um, tasks. Wonderful, thank you, Elaine. Mac, how about for you? How do both of these show up? Uh -huh. Well, first, I want to just say what an honor it is to be on this panel with you, Elaine, I, and, and I, I really appreciate your work a lot. And, um, and um, well, Jeff and Melanie, you guys do great work. And Jeff, you're my favorite editor ever. Um, you know, Jeff, you said something about the spectrum of what can appear in voices. And, 
you know, I've done everything from covering drive-by shootings in Brattleboro to writing about, you know, um, personal experiences in my life, you know, that, and, and so, so for me, it's a little bit more of a spectrum. And I, I, I think of the idea of narrative and the, and, and that the idea of accuracy in the narrative is always really important. And, you know, and sometimes you're investigating like a real personal narrative. Um, you want to be accurate to your own experience. And I've written a couple of pieces like that. Um, I had that Me Too plus, you know, I mean, my, my own Me Too story from um, a tale of sexual abuse from my adolescence and a story about um, a time that my wife and I were, you know, really racistly attacked on a on a turnaround at exit three. And, th and those were personal stories. Um, and then I think about something I put a lot of time into researching the connection between Trump and, you know, and and, and Russia, right? You know, and 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 I, th I've been on that, st I mean, you know, I mean, that story I've been following for a really long time. And that was really research-based. I didn't call anybody up. Um, and then for a piece, like I did a one on Arkham, you know, the, the late lamented dive bar in Brattleboro, that was pretty reported. Like, you know, it was still an opinion voices piece. Um, you know, so I guess I don't draw those distinctions so strongly, except to have a very clear sense of what my intention is, and then what kind of research and reporting I need to do to execute it. You know, like what's my audience? Who's my purpose? Um, you know, how long should it be? Um, and, um, so it feels like it's always kind of reporting. And then at the same time, I don't believe in the idea of objectivity exactly. I mean, that's why you have editors. I mean, you know, ultimately I'm going to be shaping things in a certain way. Um, uh, my most recent piece, I think, Jeff, you cut out like the first four paragraphs of it. And I was like, wow, that was really smart. You know, <laughs> I mean, I put like an hour or two in those paragraphs, but you made it much better um, by doing that. Um, I, I think it's really important to think about why am I writing something? Like, why do I want to do something? Um, I write all the time and I write across, I'm a, I'm a poet and I'm a short fiction writer. I teach creative nonfiction. I teach narrative nonfiction. I teach journalism. Uh, I've done journalism since I was in my twenties uh, on and off. And it, it's kind of like figuring out where, you know, what, what's this story about? You know, and with some of the folks, and I'm going to give a shout out to people like, like Kevin and Nancy, who are here from the, you know, our, our Thursday night group, um, um, that, you know, you, you're, you're making decisions about like what, you know, what's the best way, what's the story, what's the best way to tell it? And sometimes um, it is really personal. I guess the one thing I eschew is that I don't, I try not to have opinions. Like, I'm really not interested in my own opinion. You know, like, who am I? You know, I'm just some guy. Um, what I want to do is create frameworks within which people, in, within which opinions can be framed and and then discussed. And I often try to end stories with with questions rather than answers. I'm not interested in giving people answers, and I can't promise that I always do that. Sometimes I feel like with racism, I'm very passionate about it. Um, but. Um, and I'm going to jump in there, uh, Mac. How do you reconcile? Because you you said earlier um, that you don't believe in objectivity, and yet you don't believe in opinions. I, I think some people would argue those are you know one and the same. If there's no objectivity, it's it's all opinions. Well, what I would say is it's it's how I think going back to what um, what Melanie was saying about having an outline. You're organizing a story. You're creating a narrative. You know, and you're telling a story. At Newsweek, we always used to say, you know, journalism's the first draft of history. You know, you do your best, right? And 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 I think that um, the 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 uh, the organization of a piece that I write is subjective because I'm writing it. Um, you know, but I try to be as fact-based, research-based, reporting-based as possible. Even when I do, you know, voices pieces. Mm -hmm. um, the the favorite columns, some of my favorite columns, have been. Um, reporter's notebooks that Jeff, bless your soul, that you let me write after having done these special focus projects, you know, and at the end I get to use like my experience of reporting, you know, I've done, I've done 30 interviews and now I get to write, you know, 1200 words about that, you know, kind of what my take is, um, you know, at the times they call it news analysis. Mm -hmm. um, and I think a lot of what I do is kind of like in that realm rather than, you know, the sort of sense of like, I'm against, what's happening with rescue or I'm for what's happening with rescue. Like, I, I just don't, you know, I'm not, um, I'm not there. I, I, I don't feel like my opinion matters. What I want to do is try to present 
information and, mm-hmm. you know, in a, well, frankly, in a way that's readable. I mean, you really want people to just like, like what you wrote, right? I mean, it's like, you know, this is a good story. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it's funny, I'm in New York right now, hanging out with like these great journalists and, and um, you know, and that's all they really wanted to do is to like do, you know, stories that people mm-hmm want to read um but I, I think and when I say opinion I guess what I'm really saying is that I don't have a I'm not gonna I don't think that my um take on a local issue matters mm-hmm. I think what's more important is how to frame the different takes that people have on a local issue in a way that lets someone else make up their own mind I'm not telling anybody okay. what to think if that thank you sense. thank you that's really great Mac um so bouncing back to to you Elaine uh, what is your your process for structuring an opinion piece? You know, we heard Melanie say earlier in this conversation about putting together an outline. Um, what's what's your process? How do you take all these ideas and all this information and and make it a cohesive piece? So uh, I get a lot of my ideas. I, I I kind of know what I want to write about, and I'm not and I'm not always sure how I'm going to approach the topic. But I get a lot of my ideas in my head when I'm walking and when I'm driving, and I always have. I don't stop the car to re- make notes, but I do always have a notebook with me and like it by my bed and everything because you never get that phrase or that idea back the same way. Mm-hmm. Um, so so I I usually start by knowing that there's something that's a burning issue for me and I need to write about it. Um, And sometimes I have a very clear sense of how I want to start and where I'm going to go with it. And sometimes I don't. So I, if I'm, if I want to do something and I can't quite figure it out, I go for a walk or I drive, but I also jot down notes about, you know, what are the key things that I want to, that I want to say and and put in there. Um, And, um, and, you know, it's sort of like I said about journaling. I mean, you know, uh, Joan Didion once said, how do I know what I think until I see what I wrote? Right. So, um, (laughs) So that's kind of, you know, but I, I do, I do, um, well, actually, in a way, I approach it almost like writing a, a, a journalism story, because I think about, you know, what are the few things, what, what do I want to write about? What's the theme? What's the important? What's the so what question I want to answer or the mm-hmm. action step I want mm-hmm. people to take? And I, um, and so I think, I think about it logically in my head, and I, and I actually develop the piece as I write. I, I'm not somebody who just sort of, throws it all on the page and goes back and does the revisions and draft that way. I tend to, um, I tend to edit myself by the paragraph, sometimes by the oh, sentence. Interesting. Okay. So when I, so when I get to the, you know, when I get to the end, um, I'm pretty sure that I know where I'm going. And then at the revision, you know, um, I am very clear about where I'm going. Well, another thing I like to do uh, is, um, is, I I like the idea of unity in uh, opinion pieces. So readers will probably notice that I very often am able to start, go back to the lead in the, in the very end of the piece so that it's a unified whole. Um, uh, And, um, and I'm very conscious of um, word, a lot of stuff of what I want to say Mm -hmm. right here to answer you is that um, I'm going to refer back to what people have said. I mean, you have to be conscious of word count. I'm very, very big on word choice, which is a good way to be conscious of word count. Um, and one of the best pieces of advice I ever, ever got was um, go back and take out every single unnecessary word and do that over and over till you cannot take out another word. So that's very helpful with word count, but it's also really helpful with clarity and with cogent thinking and expression. And it's made me a much better writer to do that. Um, so I think it's important. Um, I always def- have to find the issue that I want to address, and I've always known why I feel it needs to be addressed and why what I need want need to say about it. Um, I also know that I probably only have space for maybe three main points, and that I have to transition them. And that's all the stuff I work up. At, I work at as I go through a piece. I don't. I don't work from an outline, but I, sometimes I work from notes. Um, so I want to know what is this I'm writing about? What's the, what's the, how am I going to answer the so what question or the action question? Um, and, and to be very conscious of the transitions. And it could range anything from a national news story to a local issue to a, a, po- a political issue. Um, I have certain areas I write about mostly, which is health and women and social justice stuff. Um, is it timed? You know, and I'm very conscious of what Melanie touched on a few of the things I wanted to say. One is the, uh, what is the hook? What is the lead? I mean, you have to, you have to promise something and deliver it and you have to, mm-hmm. 
you know, is it going to be a question, a quote, an anecdote? What is the tone I want? You know, do I want to be sardonic? Do I want to be um, a little humorous? Do I want to be absolutely straight on? Do I want to be poignant? And I, and I know, I just have a sense of that even when I sit down to write. Um, I also, uh, as I said, do the research so that I can, um, well, I, I try to convey my own credentials to do that piece when, when it's relevant. And I also look for expert opinion that will support my point of view so that it, it strengthens my own argument. Um, and uh, I've taught, I, I also mentioned about paraphrasing and direct quotes and so forth. Um, I pay close attention to the submission guidelines um, and I just try to write a piece that ends up being really cogent and pithy and important and, and not offensive, but strong, strong will that it's an up an op ed. And I and I and I've gotten better and better at that as I've gone through the years. And all I can say is wait till you see what's coming from me about SCOTUS. <laughs> Cannot wait. Cannot wait. Um, Mac, same question to you. How do you take all that's floating in the ether and cram it in, you know, the that one million pound bag of ideas in that three ounce newspaper yeah. page. <laughs> I, I mean, you know, and, you know, I'm thinking, cause I've done both kinds of work for Jeff, you know, and I've done probably in certain ways more reporting than, than opinion pieces. Um, and when you're doing that, that's just like all hands on deck, you know, 30, I mean, you know, I mean, you know, it's like you're interviewing everybody that you can and trying to figure out what your through line is. I think with opinion pieces, I, I, I really look for whether I have something to say. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I have opinions about, you know, the Ukraine and SCOTUS and, you know, like, you know, abortion. And I mean, I have opinions about all of those things, but they're not areas within which I'm expert uh, and other people are more so than I am. And there are lots of places you can read stuff about that. Um, when, you know, in terms of my process, I, I tend to start thinking of a story in my head for a while, maybe make a few notes. And then at a certain point, I'll feel like I have a sense of the shape of it and I'll start writing. And it usually takes me about 20 drafts to get to the point where I can send it to Jeff, you know, and, and that's another, you know, like, you know. And then a new iteration, phase begins. <laughs> right, right. Um, I, mean, I was thinking about, like, I did this piece when they, when they shut the 7-Eleven down across the street from where I was living on Western Avenue at the time. Mm -hmm. I was just really angry. Like, how could you shut this down? You know, like, I mean, this is where I got my milk and, you know, my eggs and stuff like that because I could walk across the street. Um, and so I started researching it, you know, and I called up the president of 7-Eleven. Like, I, you know, I called the corporate headquarters, tried to get, a, you know, a, something from him. I called up the last guy that had, um, had run it as an independent contractor as opposed to the, you know, what they did, which was kind of make it a, um, a company thing before they shut it down. Um, and I learned a lot about 7-Eleven, like, you know, labor issues with 7-Eleven, like, like a whole lot of stuff. And so the, the story started with me just being really, really angry that I couldn't pick up milk without getting in a car, you know, and, and, and then, you know, it turned into this other thing, which was, you know, in a way, not the most important story ever written, but I think really touched on the way that corporate America wrecks small towns, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that's a real issue, you know, and I tried to yeah. get at that. Um, and it was a reported piece. Um, <clears throat> so it really varies. I mean, I just, I, you know, with, with opinion, with, with voices pieces, because I'm going to like use a range for that because I've done personal essays. I've done reporters notebooks. I've done viewpoints. I mean, you know, there's a whole kind of range of stuff. Um, it, it starts with me thinking I have something not to say necessarily, not necessarily an opinion, but I have an insight into the questions that are involved and that I can draw those out in a piece that's somewhere between 1200 and 3000 words or whatever, you know, and, and, um, and that's where the, for me that I, I really don't like to do um, uh, voices pieces if I'm not reporting and researching them. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I never, I, I don't think I've ever, Jeff, you might correct me, but I don't think I've ever written a piece where I just said, this is what I think. Right. <laughs> Interesting. Well, I appreciate both of your responses because um, just for the, the sake of the audience, you know, when I was working at the ref, uh, the Commons, I did at times do reporters' notebooks, but I never really wrote for the voices section. And um, but I do write fiction and and screen screenplays, and it's so interesting for me to hear you talk about process, because for me, um, journalism is much more like building blocks. 
you know, how does this piece, and then because this piece is here, that creates this ripple effect and this ripple effect and this ripple effect. So it's it's real, really like Legos where um, fiction is so different for me. It's such a different process. It's a much more like spinning water kind of emotional process. Um, so thank you for just, even as a fellow writer, I just appreciate hearing, hearing what you have to say. Um, so can you give us any examples of both the challenges, but also, as well as the benefits of sharing um, our thoughts and our beliefs and, and our concerns with our community through something like an op-ed piece? How about we start with Elaine? Um, well, I think the, the challenge is always, you know, how am I going to approach this thing that's driving me nuts? And, um, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> um, you know, and, and also the challenge of things like structure and tone and um, yeah, even point of view and, and uh, or, or who can I go, where can I, what, what do I need to research and who do I need to try to be in touch with if I want to quote somebody and all of those like sort of logistical mechanical challenges of writing a good piece. Um, but, but I think that, um, you know, it's a real catharsis when, for, for me and for someone like me who does have strong opinions um, to, to be able to put together a piece that expresses that in a, in a way that's not only satisfying to me, but it, it legitimates and validates other people's feelings. Mm -hmm. And so that's part of the reward. And the reward also is, um, is the feedback that I get, which counteracts the negative feedback that I get. So it makes me feel that, honest to God, I really feel like my life is meaningful because I do these op-ed pieces. I don't think it's necessarily meaningful because I do journalism. It's, uh, you know, journalism is good, it's necessary. I like to do it if it's a topic I wanna to work on. But I feel, I feel privileged to be able to do point of view pieces, you know, or op-eds or, you know, and then, and then to have so, and, and so many people that, you know, I teach a lot of writing and this is right being a full-time writer is the third iteration of my professional life. I started out in national uh, and international work around um, women's health and health communication mm -hmm. and mother maternal child health that I felt very deeply about. Uh, and then I began to, I had an academic career for several years where I taught, based on that and my, my graduate degrees in health communications. And so I taught oh, wow. and, and I love teaching. I love teaching motivated or adult students. And, and so, you know, to, and I've taught internationally. So I've, I've been able to mentor people that way, um, but also to teach them better writing. I mean, I've had, I had a Burmese student who, in, when I taught in Thailand, who came from a very poor rural village. I don't know how he even got through elementary school, but somehow he got to our college. And um, I was part of a group of us who saw in him his potential and helped him to get to a better college. And ultimately, long story short, he got a Fulbright and he was at Tufts University. And when I saw him here, he said to me, I said, I, would, I will never forget you because you taught me how to think clearly and how to write well. And that changed my life. And he's now a very uh, senior person in Burma with um, the, one of the international UN organizations. So, you know, th there can be nothing more rewarding than teaching or writing in ways that help other people, that change other people's lives, that mentor them at the same time that I'm getting a real big ego feed as well. So I just feel lucky and I feel privileged to do it. And I love working with editors like Jeff and, and readers and, you know, and you just have to take the, the hard stuff when it comes because, of, and because it's usually not very legitimate. Thank you, Elaine. Mac, how about for you, the benefits and the challenges? Well, I would say if, if we're talking about opinion pieces, I think that the challenges mainly have to do with whether I have something legitimately to say. Mm -hmm. right? You know, I mean, like, and, and um, I, 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 you know, if, if I do, then it's just, you know, well, you know, like Lawrence Durrell said, writing's hard work. You just start a blank piece of paper till little drops of blood appear on your forehead. You know, I mean, and that's just true. But you know, if, if you've been doing it all your life, um, but 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 knowing that I have something meaningful to say, and I, and you know, Jeff knows. I mean, I've had some false starts on voices pieces that I thought might work out, and that just didn't. I mean, you know, they weren't. You know, I didn't have enough of a take on them, and so on. Um, the um, um, I find I find my, my reporting work in Brattleboro to be much much more difficult um, because of the emotional dimensions of it, you know, and and, mm -hmm. and the kinds of stories that I do. You wind up talking to people who are in extraordinary pain, and, yeah. or about social issues that are extraordinarily complex. Um, 
that no one has answers to. And I mean, with that, at least it's nice you don't have to answer. It's not, not your job to figure out what to do about them because you're a reporter. Um, but I, I do say to my students, you know, reporters only cry when they're by themselves, you know, the rest mm -hmm. of the time. And, you know, I mean, you know, it's sort of like you, you, you take these stories in and there's a certain element of pain eating involved with reporting, which I don't face with opinion pieces. Um, I think, you know, for me, the benefit, I mean, I, I always love it when people have liked stuff I did, but I try really hard not to have my work connected to my ego. Mm -hmm. if that makes sense you know like i'm not looking for you know i mean i just you know i'm trying to do my best job if jeff likes it then i'm good you know like i mean you know best editor i've ever had you know what you know if nobody else likes it i mean and we've gotten you know i mean i've gotten in trouble for pieces i mean you know when we were covering the drug traffic in in the first iteration a few years before covid you know we were we got a lot of heat about how much time we were putting into it you know from certain people who wanted you know other stuff or you know and that's i don't care i mean you know it's like i mean I, i'm too old to be canceled <laughs> if that makes sense you know so i i mean you know positive is great i love it when somebody says i really like that piece you know that's fun you know i like that you know if they say i really hated that piece it's kind of fun too you know i mean it's mm -hmm. like okay you know i mean you know you responded to it so um now i find the opinion stuff is really more a matter of just you know just being clear you have something to say you know and that's that's hard i mean that could be hard you know because yeah. we could all i mean you know if you're in a cocktail party we could all be talking about anything right now and have things to say but like what's worth me putting in i mean what's worth jeff putting in the paper that i have to say and mm -hmm. figuring that out i think is really challenging because i don't write a lot i mean i thought about like what it would be to be a regular columnist and one of the things that happens often when you look at the history of regular columnists is a lot of them get kind of tired after a while, you know, they're kind of mailing it in, you know, and like one out of three mm. columns is really great, but like a couple others are kind of like, what well, was in the new, I mean, I'm thinking about people like Maureen Dowd and Dale Collins, or, you know, I mean, you know, folks that I like a lot, you know, but sometimes you think, come on, you know, you know um, what's that about today? You know, um, so, um, you know, um, knowing that something I have to say is important enough for other people to read it is probably my deepest challenge mm -hmm. you know and after yeah. that the benefit is just to be done with it so that you know <laughs> so the next thing comes along <laughs> right, exactly <laughs> make room for the next thing um i don't know about either you mac or or um you elaine but um when you put together a piece i'll, I'll just speak for myself here you know when i was still writing journalism for the commons, or even when I do my, my weekly podcast, you know, I hope whatever I'm doing, it helps someone, it makes a difference, makes someone think. But I understand fully that once that piece leaves my hands, it is out of my control. Um, and I have gotten very comfortable with that over many years. I still know some friends who are not. How about for you? Like when, when your pieces leave your hands, um, are you just like fly babies and be free? Or, or are, you, are you still, are there still some, some hopes attached to the type of impact they may have? Uh, I'll start. Um, I, I archive everything and I, and I keep it for a really long time, unless it's definitely never going to come back into my mind or, 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 or currency or anything. But, but I, I often do go back to older pieces and I am able to use them to expand, um, to expand a new thing. Um, and often the same issues come up again and it's time to remind people about things. Um, and, and I, um, and I also use some of my work as teaching tools when I'm uh, teaching. So I do save a lot and I do go back to them <clears throat> and I make them better. Or I, I, I may, you know, use them in some other way. I might even use them towards a fiction piece I'm writing, you know. So, I, they're, you know, I never entirely let them go unless they're just not something I need to cling to anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and I just, um, you know, I, I'm pretty prolific and I do send out at least two columns a month, um, uh, and I've done that for a long time. So, um, yeah, I'm not, I don't remain in any way emotionally attached to them necessarily. Um, and I don't save them for reasons of ego and I don't use them for teaching for reasons of ego, but I just, because I think that they're relevant and they're instructional. And also, you know, when I'm doing writing workshops, I do them mainly now with, um, o uh, older adults and elders. Um, and I, and I, I like sharing my work with them because they're very, they're, these are very intimate workshops and I don't want to be the teacher who's like 
just sort of mm-hmm. there. I'm part of that group. And I think that, you know, I want to participate and I think I should, you know, um, uh, Vivian Gornick uh, wrote a book called uh, The Situation and the Story. And it's a subtitle, the, something, The Art of Personal Narrative, I think it is. It's a very slim book, but she makes the case for the narrator needing to be present. And a lot of times people who are writing opinion pieces, um, you know, they feel somehow that they shouldn't be in there. And she makes a really strong case for them being very present because the reader has to know, why are you writing about this? Why do you feel so passionately about this? You know, and then, and then it reinforces the, their, their own thinking or it clarifies it or it generates a different energy for them. So I, that's a very valuable little writer's book. Um, and I'm very conscious of being present when it's necessary or appropriate in, in the pieces that I write. Not again, like out of egotism, but because I think it maybe adds some level of feeling or depth to what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Elaine. How about you, Mac? Can you repeat the question? Oh, gosh. Um, it, well, it was a, it, it's, um, I'm trying to think of how to rephrase it. You know, when, when you put something out in the world, mm-hmm. uh, you may have hopes and dreams for it. Mm-hmm. Um, or you, you could just let it go. Right. Um, and I'm wondering for you, once something leaves your desk and it's in the paper, what's your relationship to it? Yeah. Well, I would say with my reporting, the reporting I've done that Jeff has allowed me to do and that I was doing with Shanta, and now that I do with my students, um, that I, I want it to have an impact. I mean, it's good. Like, you know, I mean, last summer I spent the whole summer with two other students putting together the special focus package on COVID versus opioid addiction, you know, that ran on September 15th. And, you know, you sort of hope if you put like, you know, 150 hours into something that, you know, someone's going to read it and you know, pay attention. Right. And it was, a, that was a really good package. I'm really proud of it uh, in part because the students did such a good job on that too. Um, yeah. I would say for, you know, other stuff, I mean, you know, it's, these are newspapers. I mean, you know, I mean, you know, <laughs> you know I mean, what's, line you know, burn pages at the end of the week. <laughs> exactly, you know, build a fire, you know, um, and, and, you know, and, and in that sense, you know, obviously, I mean, you want, I, I put time in, so I want someone else to, to be impacted by it. And I certainly use some of my work in my classes because I do teach a couple levels of journalism and a narrative nonfiction course. So I, you know, I mean, that's, you know, part of the, and I've had a lot of journalism interns, um, so you you know you want to use those things as a way to explain your own process and so on, um, but I think it's a mistake for journalists to think that they have a lasting. I mean, it's the first draft of history. I mean, you know, like you you're moving the ball down the road. You know, it's sort of like it's very rare for someone to write a piece that sort of catalyzes. I mean, it happens, but it's not. Mm-hmm. I'm not I'm not going to be the one that does that. I mean, that's not it's not going to be me. I mean, it's going to be somebody better than me. Um, so yeah, that's what I would say. You know, I mean, I think that you know. It, 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 it just matters. Like, we have to do this. It's journalism. Like, you know, there's nothing more important than a free press to democracy. Yeah. Literally. I mean, literally nothing. Freedom of speech and a freedom, you know, free press. And we see that everywhere in the world right now. Um, so in that sense, I'm just glad that I, I do it. <laughs> it, it, is a, it's a, it is an honor. Yes, I agree. Um, we have just a couple minutes before I want to turn it over to question and answer time. Uh, so we can, and I, I've seen an interesting uh, uh, conversation happening in the chat too that um, we might want to bring forward. But before we, we turn um, to question and answer, any last thoughts, Elaine or Mac? Um, I'm just going to close. I was just putting my email, my website in the chat. I'll go back and do that after. Um, I, I would just say that um, I think, first of all, that we all have story. We, and we all have and we all have story. All cultures have story. We all want it and we need it. And I think that um, that it's, it's important. However, we present our stories. It could be through poetry, through an op-ed, through a short fiction, through memoir. Um, I just think it's important, and I think it's important to recognize that our words are our monuments and that our testimonies matter, our voices matter. And, um, and so again, I, um, I feel very privileged to be in, in that milieu and that environment in w- which people understand that our stories, our words, our testimonies, our experiences really matter. Thank you, Mac. I would agree with you completely, Elaine, you know, and, and not minimizing it by saying that it's also ephemeral. I mean, you know, but, but, but life is ephemeral. Um, and 
that it's, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, you know, journalism and writing are the most, you know, important bearers of culture and polit- you know, political thought that we have in certain ways. I mean, there are other ways, family communication and so on, but um, no, it just really matters. I mean, it matters all the time. One, 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 one instance may not matter so much, but, you know, yeah, just doing it really matters, um, really matters. Thank you. Thank you, Mac. Um, Elaine Cliff, Mac uh, Gander, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts and your experiences with us tonight. Uh, I want to turn it over to see if there's any questions from our audience. Um, And one way we can do that is, um, do you know, you can use the raise hand function on um, your computer, or you can put something in the chat. While folks are kind of thinking of their questions, I'm going to quickly turn to the chat. Um, And Elaine also put her website uh, Elaine-Cliff.com. Um, so if you would like to, to learn more about Elaine, um, I would recommend heading over there. So uh, I'm going to quickly summarize what I'm seeing in the chat. There was a uh, Gino asked a, a question about um, what do folks in the newspaper world have to say about opinion pieces that might be a little tongue in cheek. Um, Gino really loves sarcasm in in their writing um and but worries about maybe uh, offending people and referred to uh i believe it was bella gore's piece in the reformer uh about the ukraine um uh i don't remember how many how long ago that was and um so i hope that was a good summation gino and if uh like jeff and melanie would love to respond to that i think we'd love to hear your your perspective about you know tongue in cheek and tone and how do we how do we make things work in yeah. a um, op ed yeah that um, Mr. Belagor's column created quite a stir um, <laughs> and and you know if you don't know Paul I could understand how you would be confused about where he's coming from if you know Paul you know that he's you know kind of a stereotypical Eastern European with a very blunt character and and doesn't get um, doesn't get caught up in sentimentalities. You know, he has an idea, he expresses it. Uh, that particular piece is meant, not meant to be tongue in cheek, not meant to be sarcastic. It was meant purely as an analytical piece. He was not advocating for war, as a lot of people kind of interpreted it that way. Um, he really was just trying to be analytical about what this meant, what this would mean for the United States. Uh, but going back to, to Gino's question, um, and that is the difficulty in, in a tongue in cheek piece is, um, you know, if, if the person, it, you know, if the reader doesn't really know you as well, they might not understand your style. Perhaps if you have like a regular column where you have that regular tongue in cheek style, they will grow to appreciate it. But sometimes if it comes out of the clear blue like that, it, people may have to think about it for a minute. Um, but, you know, it can be done. It can be done. It can be done very well, um, but it's it, it's an art, I would say. Um, Jeff, I, I would I would just add to that that part of the part of what we do as editors is try to make sure that that something isn't so subtle that it would be completely misread. Mm-hmm. Um, and I can't say that we are always one hundred percent successful at at um, you know at, at guessing how people are going to interpret tone mm-hmm. or or um you know there or you know there 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 are other nuances to to contributions but the but the tongue in cheek thing is is it's got to be pretty darn tongue in cheek for tongue in cheek to work in print. Mm-hmm. I yeah. I remember very early working with Jeff when the commons was still a monthly um I, and I, Gemma I you put a, a great comment in the chat and I'll get to it in a second um but I don't even remember what we were writing about, but you said, oh, this seems very Keystone Cops and I don't quite understand what this town is doing. So this sounds like a lot of fun. Go Keystone Cop it like crazy. <laughs> so that's what I wrote. I, I wrote a key, Keystone Cop version of this piece. And when Jeff sat down to read it, he's like, one, thank you for doing exactly what I asked for. Two, 
let's not do it that way. <laughs> yeah, I was I was completely wrong. Uh, and what came back was something that wasn't so much funny as it was hurtful and right and uh, and, uh, and not hurtful, but but just oh, uh, diminishing. In the, exactly. In the, exactly. My I, intention and, had not been to be hurtful, but once it was out on paper and, yeah, I and in I, big print, like, I couldn't fault you for anything that you did. It was uh, I just had, you know, I you know, I gave you the best advice I could to make an interesting, uh, and this is, you know, let's just be clear. This was, this was straight reporting. This wasn't op-ed, right? but it was, uh, it, it, and, and maybe, um, maybe that was, it would, maybe it would have been, it, it wouldn't have hit as weirdly if it were an op-ed, um, but um, it just didn't work. And sometimes, sometimes you just have to, uh, you just have to be really critical of, of, uh, and really question when you're when you're taking a chance and doing something that is outside of the normal bounds of uh, of of serious news writing with a capital N. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, Gemma Seymour, really appreciate this question. Um, Gemma wrote uh, that. Um, one one part of the particular opinion piece we're talking about, um, or or a news analysis piece that that Belgor had written, um, that that might be worth scrutiny is, you know, Belgor is the owner of um, the Reformer, and and a, several other paper papers, and is that privileged position was that a good use as um, for a newspaper publisher to use their their privilege in that way, I guess is that's not uncommon at all. Um, okay, publishers have opinion pieces all the time. In fact, a lot more than Paul has. He's on the paper for about a year, and I think he's only had four, maybe five opinion pieces in that time. And again, it's really not uncommon for publishers to have. I mean, every day or even once a week, have mm-hmm. some kind of publisher's corner or publishers. A commentary or opinion piece. So that's not unusual. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. I, I heard something. Yeah. I, I, I was, I was just going to say, Melanie, that I, I think that from, if, if I could be, if I could be really honest for a second, I think that, well, not that I try to be dishonest, but um, <laughs> I, I think that my big, biggest takeaway from Paul's piece wasn't so much what he said or even how he said it. It's, it's that it it just was hard to it was hard to find that voice and understand what he was trying to say and i think mm-hmm. and i think that uh, a lot of the a lot of the chatter that that emerged from it uh may be that um you know it it's i've 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 always had i've always had a policy well, i've had a policy since the first newspaper i worked for it's like avoid editing a writer who's also your publisher and uh, and it, and uh, I, I think that uh, that creates its own its own set of challenges and uh, and uh, I don't know quite what I would have done uh, as his editor but I think he might have benefited from some more back and forth with it mm-hmm. I see two hands up I think I saw Jessica Lee Smith's hand up first. So why don't we hear from Jessica, please? Hi. Um, Hi. Thank you guys so much. I've been, I'm really inspired. And um, to Matt, Mr. Gander, I just want to say I completely understand what you're saying. And I find that like, it's almost like since the day I was born, I've been offending people for the wrong reasons. Everything that comes out of my mouth is misinterpreted. And um, of course, I could definitely benefit from planning and outlining and all that stuff. And my mind is like a massive ADD chaos. And, you know, I wish I worked for some, somebody who could point me in that direction or say, take this out. Or, you know what I mean? When I look back at my writing, it's like a big jumbled thing. And I'm seeing it on my small phone and it's all, I can't even get up, scroll back up to see if I, find. and then once I put it out there, you were just saying that was a good point when it's out there, like, how do you feel about it? And I worry when it's out there because I feel like in that moment when I was emotionally talking that I'll be misinterpreted again. And it always does happen. It's like, I can't figure out what I'm doing, you know, with everything I'm writing or saying, I know my writing is very, like, it's very sloppy. I'm nothing like you guys, you know, but I'm like a child that's in this, like by myself. 
and I can't really even, you know, I, but I know that I have like regrets about certain things and I don't know how I'm offending people, but I think it goes in line with what you were saying about Mr. Belcour, if that's how you say his name, um, is that, you know, yes, people do do those pieces and like myself too, people do it. And I could say the same thing, like, well, what about, you know, Howard Stern or so-and-so that does a podcast that's offending everybody, you know, and everybody, but he is an audience and, he, and everybody wants to work with him. You know, why can't I be that person, even though I'm not as offensive, if somebody takes something I'm saying wrong, not everybody has to like me, but at least I'll be saying it for a good cause or something, but I'm still doing it the wrong way that I don't know what I'm doing wrong. So, so Jessica, I think that's a really great point. And I, I think what I'm hearing is one of the challenges is, is you are a lone writer doing this on your own. And so if you don't mind, I'd love to hear from Jeff and Melanie and even Mac and Elaine, if they have thoughts. Can, on, can I just um, say one more thing? Can oh, I sure. Yeah. One more thing that I was just going to say was um, that, um, that, 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 that Mr. Bellicor, what I was saying about him was, was that he also came back that he was living internationally. I'm from, you know, a different area. You also have to take into account like that area. You know, I may be offending people. My very energy seems to offend people sometimes. And I don't know how, or it's off-putting. That's the word, off-putting. And I don't know what it is about me that's off-putting or why everything about me is off-putting. So yes, I would like to hear from you guys, but that's what I'm saying. I don't even know what I'm doing wrong, you know? Because like I was raised, maybe I was raised in a situation where people spoke like that. Maybe I don't have a boundary that I'm supposed to. You know, maybe I, you know, I don't know what I'm doing wrong, but I'm always so, coming from the heart. Any, any suggestions, uh, folks, for the lone writer? Uh, I, I, I would say that what I'm hearing is two things that you should try to, that, that seem to be rolled up together that you, that it would, be, I think it would benefit you from trying to pull apart and work on one one after the other one is uh is is um uh, put us put uh, being offensive aside or be perceived as you know, whatever people are taking away from it aside what 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 really makes me think that that diagnose uh, uh something to work on is people not understanding what you're trying to say and if they don't understand what you're trying to say then yeah, that getting a, they're getting offended possibly for the wrong reasons. It's a good uh, right. It's confusing. So, Maybe my writing is confusing. Yeah. Yeah. So, like so, that. so, so, uh, I, I would say, I would say, um, you know, and, and again, this is, this is not looking at your writing. This is not, not, you know, not even, you know, just from, just from knowing what you've just said here, I would, I would, I would suggest maybe slowing down. Uh, you say it sounds uh, it sounds like you uh, just just take a piece of writing and just try to whatever you're trying to do with it, cut that in half and try to do something less, you know, just just, um, you know, just just try, try to try to do what Elaine suggested and then just you know, pull out everything that you don't need until you can't pull out any more and then simplify it and then test that. See if that see if that lands better or more accurately, and then when when you're getting right, you're writing a little more stable, then you can see what people are thinking about that, and then you can address whether they're whether you're offending whether people are being offended for reasons that are their problem or whether they're getting offended for reasons that you don't want them to get offended by. Thank Does you, that, Jeff. Is that helpful? Does that? Yes, make sense? thank you. Yes, yes, totally. Oh, all right. You. Uh, like taking it in Elaine. doses instead of taking it all on, taking it, not taking on the whole mountain at once, like taking it in doses where I, you know, so I can get more of a clear cut, you know, because it may just be like you were saying, which is a great point. A lot of my, maybe that like confusion is coming from my, maybe the way that I'm writing it. Well, you know, let me, let me, jumble, but, yeah. yeah, let me, let, and I'm sorry to monopolize here. I just want to say one last thing to Jessica and then I'll, I'll hand the floor over. Uh, I'm coming at this as an editor with flaming ADHD. I know how I, I could tell when, and you kind of mentioned that in, in your, what you just said, I know, <laughs> how, I know how I think, and I know what I have to pull back in order to make my own writing make sense to anybody. And that's just, just stop and just take it one step at a time and, and slow down because, because if, if it's just really, um, you know, you're, you, if, if you're, go, if you're firing on all cylinders and trying to, and, 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 and your head is 
your head is making hyperlinks the way that our brains are uniquely wired to do, then it's going to be, it, you're going to be kind of at war with your own head. Uh, mm-hmm. And that's getting, and getting to understand that and work with it. I'm happy, you know, that, that's, that's, that's something to just take into account as, as something, as, as a piece of the puzzle. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Jeff. Um, just in the interest of time, I, I want to move on. Uh, Elaine, I think you had a comment and then I yes. want to hear from Matt. Okay, um, so I think that Jeff's advice is really, really critical and important. And I think one way that, um, that you could be uh, helped with all this, I think what's happening, I, I, I sort of picked up on that little ADHD thing too. And, um, and I think that it's so easy to be overwhelmed by your own ideas that you get, you get in a frenzy. I mean, one gets in a frenzy. And, um, and I think what would really, really help you is to be part of a writer's group where you get really good, uh, facilitated by a good writer. And I think that um, you get p- feedback. People can, people, you'll begin to understand why people are you know, feeling what they're feeling and how you can address that. And, and also a, a lot of workshop writing is, there's a lot of prompted writing and that's a tremendously good way to learn how to, to write to a prompt rather than have to deal with this flood of ideas and words that are overwhelming you. Um, coupled with the, the uh, constructive criticism and the um, support that you get from being in a writing group. So, or taking some writing classes. I just think that'd be enormously Thank helpful. you, that's a great in the way. That, uh, the way that Jeff was talking about. Thank you, Elaine. <clears throat> Mac, I see you've had your hand raised. Yeah, I, I, one quick thing for you, Jessica. I, I, I see Mindy here and I see Nancy and we do do this regular Thursday evening thing at 7.30 and you're more than welcome to join. It's really a lot of different levels of skill and so on. And it's a good writer's group and it's fun. Um, and people like Mindy and Nancy are really great helps. And Kevin was here earlier. On There's Thursday? A good, a good, great. So uh, on Thursday? So Thursdays at 7.30. Yeah, if you, if you um, I think we might be friends on Facebook or you can just email me. But what I wanted to do is talk about the, this earlier thing about <clears throat> Paul's piece. Um, which, which I take really seriously because I wrote a response in the comments to it. And, and one, I want to say, Melanie, you're right. I mean, publishers do this all the time. That's just, mm-hmm. and, and the second thing I would say is that it was, a, it was a little bit long and you kind of have to know the intersection between global politics and global finance to like really follow the whole darn thing. And I happen to know about that stuff. Um, and I disagreed with this point. Um, and, and Jeff, actually, that this is the piece where, Jeff, you cut out like the first five paragraphs where I refuted his, his intellectual argument and then like, went into the whole idea that we should be thinking about the hum, human dimension of Ukraine rather than the, the potential political and financial benefits to the United States. But he wasn't wrong or right. I disagree with him. I mean, I've studied these things, too. I mean, he's a really smart guy. I am, too. Um, but part, part of the point I would make about that is like, he has every right to publish that. There was nothing offensive in it. I mean, it was, it, I mean, it, it, you could disagree with it a lot. And I did, right? I mean, I, but I, I disagree with it on intellectual terms first, because I, I don't think his analysis is accurate. I think mine is better. But, you know, that kind of came out of the piece I drafted. I also think it's not, it wasn't a good time to be talking about financial benefits from, you know, <laughs> World War Three, right? I mean, you know, I mean, you know, but at the same time, it's kind of like, so, and, and I guess my point would be, without being long-winded, is that, that it, it's a free marketplace of ideas, right? That's the whole point, right? I mean, that's why we have journalism, you know? And, and so, you know, Paul's piece, um, you know, I, it gave me a chance to think about, like, well, what do I think about this? And then I wrote a piece, and Jeff published it, um, you know, and, and, and you didn't make it, and I think that was quite uh, smart in kind of terms of local on politics that I wasn't like Gander going after Belagar, you know, I mean that, and, and that makes sense, right? I mean, I, I totally got it. I never even talked to you about it. I said, you, you know, you cut it. You said, you said to me, you know, to take a look at this. I kind of did it differently than you had in mind. And I looked at it and I said, looks good if you think that's how it should run. Um, you know, there's a lot of intellectual discussion to have about his argument, which may turn out to be absolutely true. I mean, this may, you know, the war in Ukraine may be one of the best things that ever happened to NATO in the United States. It's a terrible thing to say, right? But that's his argument. And it's a very cold financial argument. Um, and it was a very hurtful piece for me because, yeah, because I'm really paying close attention to what's happening in the Ukraine. Like I watch the clips, you know, I've been watching I, every day, right? You know, the headlines. Um, so I, 
I would leave it at that idea, which is that we have to, it, we have to be ready for opinions that we violently disagree with and then disagree with them in civil and thoughtful ways. And I did that, you know, in that piece, which I thought was really you know, pretty good. It was not so bad. You know, I kind of wish I'd love to have the argument with Paul about like, you know, the financial implications, because I would love to, I mean, I know, I know this stuff too, right? Like, you know, so it's kind of like, it's not like I haven't been around the block for a lot of years. Um, we'll so, we'll set up a, um, a virtual Zoom coffee between the two of you. and <laughs> That would be really fun. I'd love that. <laughs> can I read the first four paragraphs that Jeff cut? <laughs> <laughs> you can put them in the chat. Um, uh, Anyways, so, I'm, I'm going to dial out here, guys. I, I got, I've been staying with friends. This has really been fun, and I appreciate everybody. Um, if you want to be in a Thursday night workshop with me, um, it's not a workshop. It's just a writer's group. Um, just email me at, m, at mac at commonsnews.org. Um, but otherwise, I'm going to head out. Okay. So nice Thank to you see so everybody. Much, Matt. Thanks, Matt. Thank you, Matt. Great to see you. Um, so, yeah, we I think we have had planned to end around 8.30, um, and it's 821 now. So I just want to check in um, some great conversations happening in the chat. Um, how about questions? Anyone else have any questions or comments? And I'm, I'm sorry, I totally forgot my neighbors were having a drum circle tonight. So if you can hear that, <laughs> the music sounds beautiful, but um, wasn't planning on it. It's been the background. <laughs> um, uh, hello. Um, Hello, I heard somebody. Yes, um, Nye here. Oh, hi, Nye. Hi. Um, <clears throat> I, I've been sitting on a whole bunch of questions, but um, one of them is, uh, I think it's probably the most quickly answered. Um, let's see, start my video. Oh. Okay. There you are. Good to see yeah. your face. I hey, wondered bye. why I didn't have a face. Um, <laughs> my, my first quickest question is, what about um, using, using an alias, using a pseudonym? I know there's at least one writer in the Reformer who does. I talked to my daughter, who is a, a veteran um, journalist and she said I would never allow that but I'm wondering I'm I have some pretty strong feelings about things like abortion and religion and and how things work and I'm afraid of death threats frankly mm -hmm. um, I'm, af I'm afraid of the kind of um, back chat that that isn't constructive I'm, I'm I don't mind arguing something with somebody, but but I don't want to be. Um, mm -hmm. So Melanie, be uh, yeah, Melanie I'm Jeff, not sure yeah. which which columnist you're referring to. You said there was a columnist in the Reformer that used a pseudonym. Oh, um, Arlo Mudgett. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's part of his, his personality. He's got a radio show and it's all, and he's not like a, a political columnist. It's more of a, it's, it's more of an everyday life kind of columnist. So that's a little bit separate than, than well, getting into politics. Yeah, but it's also an alias, a, a pseudonym. Um, so, well, I, I mean, it's like I said, it's, it's, it's all part of his, his his radio personality and and his I mean it's it's like his he, byline. He's an actor playing. A, he's an actor a part. playing. No, not all at once, please. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, most that that's probably the only exception that I'm aware of. Like I said, it's not a, a political column. Uh, when it comes to letters and and political columns, uh, okay. we don't allow pseudonyms or or anonymous letters because that's the answer to the question. Not about yeah. Arlo, Arlo, but about yeah. It it just it just leads to too much abuse. Oh, so um, you know, I, I've had people that have tried to get some some false stuff in a letter, and it turns out that they're uh -huh. not even who they say they are. And okay, so but that, that ends up blowing up in our face. But to to address the anxiety that I have about violent reactions to something that I might say. 
So Jeff um, put his hand up. I think he uh, has a comment. Well, uh, I'm going to I'm going to first say that 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 uh, you know you know our general policy is is to say no, we don't do that. Uh, I have broke you know I have made waivers to that on occasion when uh, for very unusual circumstances when the publishing of something on the basis of of needing you know you know some you know i guess it would have to be a one on it would have to be uh, i would be i would be i would be reticent to pub, to publish under a pseudonym um under most circumstances and i think that there would have to be some really unusual um uh really really de de demonstrable danger uh for for me to to really to really you know, kind of breach that because as melanie mm -hmm. said once you kind of cross that rubicon it's it gets it gets really complicated for mm -hmm. other people coming in and what you know and it turning into a a uh, people people really do have to stand behind their opinions yeah uh, but at the same time, uh, you know, I, I'm not, I'm, I'm always going to listen to, uh, you know, come on in and, and talk to me. Let me, let, you know, try, you know, tell me, tell me, tell me what is, what is, you know, you know, what the opinion is, what the, you know, what the, the threat is. And then we can, we can, uh, we can, um, my answer is probably going to be no, but I, I do I have said yes sometimes uh, because, because there is something really legitimate and that in itself might be a news story um, in mm -hmm. some way. So it's worth, you know, I'm always happy to have that conversation. Uh, I will say that every time I, every time I violate that, um, you know, that, that rule, uh, you know, there, you know, I get, um, you know, I'm, it it comes it 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 um, it is not without cost to mm -hmm. the paper and to me personally in terms mm -hmm. of people questioning that those you know that that decision um, mm. are using that as an example to make an exception for them as well. Yeah. So so and it, uh, and it, you know it opens up the floodgates. It opens up the floodgates, and it's also not fair to Melanie and the and the folks at Reformer too because you know we you know. You know, people are going to traipse over and say, well, the commons will do that. Uh, you know, I don't, you know, I don't want to, you know, I, and we don't do it often enough that I have, you know, that, that, that I think it's a huge compromise, but it certainly, it certainly could reverberate if, if, if we were to be um, more, you know, if we were to be less stringent as we are, okay. or, or, you know, what I'm saying, um, but I, does, that, I want, does that answer your question, Nye? Yeah, it more than answers it. Okay. Um, um, do you have a? You you said you had a few other questions. I I do, but but it's it's hard to retrieve. Um, now, now, if you I know, and I know our time is 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 going short. But I know, I know. Could I? Could know, I? But uh, let me just say, if you want to email me. Jeff at commonsnews.org. I'm sure Melanie would take uh, yep. off, offline questions as well. I'd be happy I, to have a conversation with you about anything. I got, thank you. I got the, the, the piece back, which is that um, in writing about abortion, I have a very strong poem that I wrote about abortion in 1970. It's um, appropriate again now. I don't know whether you have to be veranda porch to get <laughs> published, but um, uh, we accept poems all the time. You do, yes. Didn't I, know that. I yep. I take I take a look at it too. Uh, I I'm a little apprehensive about poetry because one I'm not a poet and I don't know poetry and I'm so that means I'm not as a strong editor of same. Uh, and two, there are a lot of bad poets out there, and I'm I know poetry. that. So, but you know, send it along. Let's talk. I'm, I'm yeah. We don't usually get a right. lot of poetry submissions, but they uh -huh. usually the ones we do get are usually pretty good. So, I <laughs> yeah. think I saw something in the Reformer years ago saying we have a policy not to accept 
poetry. So that m- may have changed. Oh, that was before I got here. Okay. <laughs> All right, um, thank you very much. You're welcome, Nye. Thank you for those really great questions um, and important questions, uh, especially around uh, pseudonyms. It is 8.30. We have time for one more question if someone would like to like to ask a question. Oh, did I see a hand? Nope. Well, if you don't have anything else, I, I do want to say that um, some of the sound, for instance, Matt Gander's sound was so percussive that it hurt. Okay, and good to know. I don't know whether it was um, volume or whether it was closeness to the mic or what, but I couldn't. That might be your settings over there. I'm just saying. I'm just well, it's about also that- my head, you know, but it, it's. Um, I couldn't really pay attention to what he was saying because it hurt. Okay. Thank you for letting us know. Just uh, in general, folks, we will um, be having more media mentoring programs coming up. Uh, We'll be taking a break and then we'll have more. So in the future, if you're ever in one of these sessions and you're having an issue like that, please put it in the chat because we can... um, I don't Address know what that is. There. I'm 90 years old and I don't know what the chat is. Then feel free to just speak up and, okay. and let us know because we would have loved to have helped um, with that. Yeah, thanks. Um, so thank you, Nye. Um, any other? It looks. Um, oh, Jeff. I have a question. Oh, sorry, sorry, Jessica. Yes. No, I will let Jeff go. I apologize. I didn't want to. Oh, interrupt. I, I was just going oh. to say. I was just going to say as a last, as a last, uh, my parting shot here is to recognize that uh, uh, among the people in the chat here, uh, the audience is uh, Mindy Haskin Rogers, who wrote the astoundingly, uh, uh, I don't even have the words to describe it. Uh, she wrote the piece last year on, uh, on the, uh, the legacy of sexual abuse at Brattleboro Union High School. And if ever there was a combination, kind of the nexus of journalism, of opinion, of all the issues that we started to touch on with the, uh, you know, with with uh, um, you know uh, libel and issue, you know, j- just putting your neck out, uh, and then having a lasting impact and uh, and uh, affecting positive change in the community. I mean, that piece just brought all of these concepts together. And I don't, I, I would be remiss if I didn't just say thank you to Mindy and thank you for being here as well. Thank you, Mindy. Uh, Jessica, quickly. Yeah, you no, I was a- just going to say that in, in terms of broadcasting here or media, um, I was looking up online how to be like, do you have to be licensed or whatever to be recognized as media here? And I, you know, do you have to get a, is there an association? Like when I was in acting, it was SAG and AFTRA and equity, you know, like, but is there something else with broadcasting? And so the broadcasting association, but it said that you didn't need anything, but I wasn't sure if that was the case because I didn't know how to present myself to my town. Let's say, for example, if I wanted to do some sort of something with with the town to be recognized that way. Indeed, Jeff. I I don't think there, I mean, you, Journalism is no, the one profession where you can where you can actually, ha- you know, just put it put a tack a sign to your door and say, "Hi, I'm a journalist," and you're a journalist. Um, media is what you make it, and that's both the power and the and the, the 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 crazy responsibility that we have, and then arguably one of the reasons that the Commons and Vermont Independent Media created the Media Mentoring Project is to be able to help people who at all levels who want to make media make make it responsibly and effectively. Uh, but can so, we, you can do it with limited media. Like I have a small, like I have a very, I'm very limited in my media. Obviously I have just a phone. And when I go to meetings and things like that, I'll be told to like, I'll be, you know, they'll almost like want me to turn it off or ask me why I'm doing that. As opposed to the other people who have the better cameras and everything like that. You yeah, know what yeah. I'm saying? Uh, I think that's a, that's a topic for another time. Yeah. Uh, and I'm happy to, I'm happy to talk to you offline about that. Uh, I, I, because there's a lot to say about it and we don't have much time. Uh, yeah. But I, but but uh, but let's get in touch, Jessica. I'd be happy to talk to you. Thank you for that, Jeff. Um, so uh, 
Yes, thank you, Elaine. It was so wonderful to have you here tonight. Um, I want to thank everyone for joining. I think we have, we're all going to turn into pumpkins fairly soon here. <laughs> um, so I just want to, before we go, I just want to remind folks that this is our final uh, media mentoring project program for this spring, but um, the series will begin again, um, I believe in uh, the fall. But in the meantime, um, as, as Mac mentioned, if you would like to participate in a weekly um, journalism writing workshop with Mac, uh, you can come once, you can come every week, whatever it is. Um, it's on Thursdays. And Jeff, how do people um, get in contact with Mac or do they need to sign up for that? Uh, I, I believe you do have to get in contact with Mac and it's as simple as emailing Mac at commonsnews.org. Mac M -E -C. at commonsnews, one word, dot org. Fantastic. Thank you. Well, that is it for tonight, everybody. On behalf of Vermont Independent Media, uh, we thank our panelists and uh, we thank everyone who joined the conversation. And please, everyone have a wonderful night. Thank, thank you, Olga. Thank, thank you. Everybody. Great group.